The Cold War. A time of wonder, paranoia, but most of all fear. Little could shake the overlooming threat of the end of it all. Both the Soviet Union and America feared the same result. Who would strike first? Almost just as important, what happens when somebody strikes back? The effects of nuclear war are absolute. Nothing remains untouched. With so much anticipation building towards a war that would never be, it can be surprising how not a single weapon of mass destruction was fired between these two nations during this time. The answer can be attributed to Mutually Assured Destruction, or MAD. To refresh, this is the concept that in the event of two nations at odds with each other, both the capacity to end their opponent in their entirety, only the fear of the end of the world keeps them from doing so. Sure, getting the first hit counts for something, but when they come back with everything they have, nobody can win. For decades, this was the assumption why we hadn't seen this scenario come to fruition. Mutually assured destruction kept the world safe from the immediate guaranteed danger of the end of the world. However, some doubted the effectiveness of basing global security within this idea. Out of this discontent with MAD came the Strategic Defense Initiative, or as coined by the media, Star Wars. The Reagan administration, with Ronald himself in particular, were not too pleased with the reliance on mutually assured destruction. After all, in no way was this policy the absolute guarantee it was often made out to be. In several scenarios, the policy of MAD falls apart, and with no true deterrent after it dissolves. First off is the idea of defending against the second strike. If a nation were to launch nukes at the enemy only to find out all those weapons were destroyed by a previously unknown defense force, the nation would be subject to a response that may result in it ceasing to exist. Another possibility is that no guarantee could be placed on who fired the missile to begin with. After all, both the Soviets and China were capable of such an attack, and it would be paramount to know who fired the first shot. Guessing wrong could result in a world war, and even more nukes going off in the process. It would also be possible for a third party to acquire and launch such a weapon, and then the question whether it was a one-off attack or the start of a nuclear war would be unclear with every second counting. Not to mention that if a world leader or other force decided that the end of the world wouldn't be so bad, mutually assured destruction no longer functions as a deterrent for one of the parties at play. The Soviets had a plan in case of being hit with a first strike. In the possible chance that all Soviet leaders would be killed in the nuclear fight, a program named Dead Hand would retaliate without human initiation. This was possible as sensors would detect various measurements resulting from a nuclear blast and, in defense, send nukes off to the likely target that's the United States in case you're wondering. It was essentially putting even more faith into the MAD concept, as even if the US were to eliminate all core Soviet leaders, the world would still come to an end. Instead of opting for a similar policy, Reagan would introduce SDI in 1983 as the alternative to MAD. SDI differed from most operations as it functioned to defend rather than attack. At its core, it would function to destroy weapons of mass destruction before they hit the United States. How this would be achieved was really what gave the planned initiative its publicity, both for good and bad. There were a few different plans in place to take down ICBMs, ranging from a nuclear bomb-powered X-ray laser in space to a railgun that would fire projectiles close to 2.5 kilometers per second, almost 5,600 miles per hour. A few ideas were centered in space, which seemed somewhat impractical at the time even though many weren't related to lasers at all. Space travel would make the project inconceivably expensive, regardless of effectiveness. By today's standards, the closest comparison would be the International Space Station, estimated to cost $150 billion. Now, SDI would have dwarfed this cost, for the fact that not only would it need to have many satellites scattered through orbit, they all would effectively function as the pinnacle of weaponry for the time. Even with the cost, it would be untold whether the initiative would function as planned after launch, or even whether they would not be destroyed by the Soviets at first chance, or by the natural hazards of space. Sending a satellite for research or communications is one thing, but sending a billion dollar laser and hoping for the best is on a whole different level. The reaction from the media was one of doubt, to say the least. It didn't appear practical given the time it was announced, and furthermore, it wasn't any more guaranteed than MAD, given the absorbent cost and complex nature of the plants. Space lasers or not, the concept of defending against potentially thousands of nuclear weapons with absolute certainty seemed like fiction. This would lead the media to christian the program Star Wars. The moniker was more than a little inaccurate, but it still gave the public an idea of what it strived to do, and of course, 
It seemed a little far-fetched to him. Given the lack of support from the public and the inconsistencies in the initiative itself, full funding and time was never given to the project to allow it to see its full potential. Some argue that SDI wasn't ever going to succeed, and instead it functioned to scare the leaders of the Soviet Union into overspending. If the United States were to have complete defense against a potential Soviet attack, what would deter the United States from launching the first nuke? While treaties such as the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 would make the nuclear X-ray illegal, as nukes were not allowed in any capacity in space, the US had more plans including tungsten-based projectiles that would serve a similar function. To combat this, the Soviet Union would have to devote more money and time into protecting itself and preparing for a war that in the end would never come. This weakened the economy and would contribute to some extent to the fall of the nation in 1991. Even though it never reached its potential, the concept is fascinating. Science fiction founded in reality, and at the same time, just a bit too unorthodox to gain mass appeal. Regardless of its intent or success, it's an interesting chapter from the time of the Cold War. This is Cody of Knowledge Hub.